G'day there, welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and I'm really excited to have Jonathan Pajot on, uh, on, on the episode today. Jonathan Pajot is a professional artist, writer, and public speaker. I've seen him give lectures with Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein and others. Uh, he gives workshops and conferences all around North America. He teaches carving, speaks on art, but mostly explores symbolic structures that underlie our experience of the world. Today, we are going to be talking about the difference between iconography and pornography. I've had this idea for a while that pornography is almost like the anti-icon, whereas the icon reveals, pornography conceals the mystery of the person. That's what we'll talk about, and I'm sure that uh, Jonathan will have a lot of interesting things to share. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you guys about Hallow, which is a fantastic app that can help you pray. So if you've been wanting to pray, meditate more, it's the new year and all that, this will help you do that. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. It is the number one Catholic app on in, 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 in North America. Number one downloaded app. Tons of five-star reviews. Very sophisticated, 100% Catholic. It has sleep stories. It'll lead you through Lexio Divinas, if you know what that is. <laughs> you can do examinations of conscience at night. It's really well done. Now, they have a free version of their app, so you can just go download it right now and get a bunch of free stuff, and you'll see how well-produced it is. But they also have um, a whole lot of other content that you can only get access to by subscribing. But if you want to get three months for free and get access to everything on their app, Click the link in the description below, hello.com slash Matt Frad. Use that as a promo code, Matt Frad, and then you'll get everything on the app for free for three months. If you don't like it, you can just cancel. You won't be charged a cent. I have it. My wife has used it. We really like it, and I think you will too. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. Hello.com slash Matt Frad. All right. Here is my interview with Jonathan Pajot. Thanks. Jonathan Pajot. Did I get that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, good. That's cool. That's a cool way of saying it. Australians are really great at butchering names that should sound lovely like that, like Paggy, Paggio or something. It's hard to say my name in English because we don't, usually the Ajo is not an English pronunciation. Uh, like the normal way would be to say Pajo or something like that. It's just not, it's a, it's a very French way of saying, uh, a very French name. French is my first language, so. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's really lovely to meet you. I don't know how we first connected. Somebody told me I should interview you, and then I, I looked, I looked you up, and I really enjoyed, you know, the things you had to say. And I, I go to an Eastern Catholic church, and so you know, all that you were doing with icons, I found super intriguing. So it's really nice to finally touch base. Yeah, same. I've had several people in my, let's say, people following me who said, you know, you know, Matt Fred, what he's doing, and so I looked into what you're doing. So I was happy that that you connected with me, and I thought. I think you connected with me, with me in March, and then with the oh, pandemic yeah. and everything, it, things just kind of we didn't we didn't follow through. And then recently, someone said again, you know, you need to to contact him. And I th I think I remember an email by him. So I went in and I said, yeah, perfect, right. let's do this. That's right. So I mean, it's hard for me to kind of gauge reality at this point. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm about to move to Steubenville, Ohio, but right now I'm in Georgia. And I don't know if I've just drunk the Kool-Aid or what, but like any kind of lockdown, any kind of mandatory whatever just like really rubs me the wrong way. Meanwhile, my family in Australia had this six-day lockdown. They weren't allowed to walk their dog. I don't see the reason. Anyway, so it really bothers me. And then I, I've seen a few things uh, up in Canada where these police have broken into a person's house Gestapo style. And I, I find it super troubling. I just was interested what you thought. Yeah, it's very, I find it very troubling as well. We just have, they've started a new lockdown now, which is uh, with an 8 p.m. curfew. You know, you're not allowed to walk with other people, not allowed to, to I think they said if, if someone is living alone, one person is allowed to go visit them or something oh, like how that. How friggin' generous. Yeah, exactly. It, so it's, It really uh, pisses me off. I, like, who the hell are these people to tell us this kind of stuff? And I, know, I think up in Canada, I'm, I'm, how old do I look? I'm cleaning my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just old and curmudgeon. Everything pisses me off. It's not just Canada. Um, you know, I, I've heard, I've got some friends up in Canada, and they say they're kind of encouraged to snitch on their neighbors yep. if they have large gatherings. What a great way to destroy the sort of social fabric. Well, that's what it feels like. What it feels like is is a difficulty 
it's there's a kind of materialism which is seeped in, you know, where we think that the integrity of the body is the only thing that matters, you know, and so it's it's in line with a kind of insipid materialism that we live with. And then there's a kind of objective sense where they feel like because we're talking about medical, therefore there's no opinion to be had. There's no <clears throat> there's no morality involved. It's just we're going to save lives and we're going to do anything we can for people to stop dying. Uh, and so they feel people just accept it. And also we've we've accepted the role of the state as this totalizing thing in our in our lives. It's something which has been seeping in, you know, after World War II, it just started to grow and grow and grow and grow. And now everybody has just accepted it. And we think that basically the state can tell us what to do. They basically manage our identities. They manage, they're allowed to tell religious groups if they can meet or not. And, you know, and they all do it for our, our good. And so it's a very, it's a strange situation that we've, we've kind of seeped into a authoritarian uh, state. And people tell me it's for a good reason. And I, and maybe, I don't know, but it's, <laughs> Authorian states have always said it's for a good reason. You, you wouldn't install authoritarianism for a bad reason. It's always we're doing it for your good, right? We're doing it to help you. So, yeah, it's a, it's a frightening moment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, gosh, I, I just saw recently these Greek Orthodox Christians uh, were like, f you know, uh, meeting regardless of the uh, f for Epiphany, regardless of the COVID laws, which I thought was just super badass. I was pumped about that. Um, yeah, there's just part of me that's just like we, we've almost like totally given them this control. We've allowed it. So like it, it's times like this that make me look at my like conservative conspiracy theory friends and be like, mm, tell me what you were saying again, because it's yeah. It, well, it definitely with, feels like there is some at least agreement among nations because they're all using the same words. They're all using the same language. Mm. You know, we've heard this bill build back better used by biden and then trudeau and then you know boris uh in england and so it's like everybody's using the same language and so it's even though you don't necessarily need to think of a top-down conspiracy there's at least a strange agreement about what it is we're doing and yeah. and uh and the sacrifices we're willing to make in order to get there and i think that's what no one talks about is is that we we've we have this goal and we think they they talk as if we're willing to sacrifice everything to get to this goal and we don't want to talk about the cost in terms of everything else, mental health, society, uh, the, the cohesion of groups, you know, the, even the abandonment of the elderly. Like we've completely in Quebec, like the elderly have been completely abandoned and we do it for them. Like we're we're doing it for their good, but we're not allowed to visit them. They're not allowed to see anybody there. I know some people whose uh, uncles, parents are in an apartment and they haven't left for months and they're not allowed to even walk out on their balcony. And so yeah. it's insane. Did you see that Parler just got shut down because Amazon kicked them off their servers and app? Do you know what Parler is? Yes, yes. Yeah. No, that's, that's Try and a look whole it up. other it thing It doesn't exist happened. anymore. No, it, it just, doesn't exist. It's been nuked. This is ridiculous. Yep. I, no, I tell you. There, there's, a, there's a serious <laughs> lockdown on information. The, and it all, it fits together even if it doesn't, even if it's not, whether it's planned or not, it fits together because as we're at home and we encounter the world only through the internet, then that becomes the frame for reality. Yes. And so if you're able to now control that frame, then you have a control over what reality is and you can tell people what's happening and they have no way to know besides yeah. accessing reality through like this I, I get the argument when someone says these are private companies they can do what they want but as you say when Twitter and Facebook and Instagram have become the town square and then you say and you are not allowed to come um, and then say you know it does really feel like you're canceling free speech yeah. and it does not kind of feel like a breach of the First Amendment even though I know technically it isn't but not only you're not allowed to come to the town square but we're gonna shut down any other town square that you try to open yeah. And so it's not yeah. just that. I know. It's like, can we go meet over here and chat? No, no that's banned too. This is insane. I, um, I, I'm just sort of waiting. I was talking to my wife today and I'm like, okay, I just hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. I'm excited. Just cancel it. Like, come at me. I just, I just can't wait. Like, so here we go. Maybe this would get me kicked off. If you are a, if you are a Catholic or an Orthodox out there, go find a priest who will flout the COVID rules to bring you Eucharist. Uh, if this thing gets locked down, I've already found some priests. They're like, absolutely. He's like, we're going to print out MapQuest directions. We won't even let have people use Google. We're going to meet in a parishioner's home and you'll receive Eucharist. Bring it. 
Well, it's it seems like I mean, I think that that's the kind of thing that's been happening uh, just privately, I would say. And I know that some churches are being more stricter in terms of the, the, the guidelines and some are being at least secretly more permissive. And so it's hard because we're also called as Christians to to obey the rule of the state. We're no, we, we try to not be to rebel against the rule for no reason. Of course, if, we, yeah, if the law is reasonable, we should yeah. obey it. <laughs> It's a tough situation. It's a very difficult. It's a very difficult place that we are in right now. That's for sure. And it's hard to know what is the right thing. What is the right thing? No, it's totally. You're exactly right. I mean, everyone with a bloody YouTube channel thinks they're an expert. Exhibit A, and I know nothing. I know nothing except I just want to be left alone to worship God and be with my friends and family. But so I'm fully, you know, fully admitting that I don't know what I'm talking about in many respects. And I know we're all we're all listening to people who don't know what they're talking about either. And then just whoever feels the most appealing to us, we I don't know. It's crazy. So I just want to take a quick moment to tell you about Ethos Logos Investments because they're an amazing Catholic invest, inf- investment group that will help you invest with character. I used to think that investing was something only rich people did or old people did or people who were, I don't know, like just good at complicated things. <laughs> but this is actually not a complicated thing to do at all. If you go to elinvestments.net slash pints, Click the description below. You can see like a five-minute interview I did with the founder of this group and see why this is a really smart thing to do, especially in a time like this. elinvestments.net slash pints because you could invest with a different kind of investment company and end up profiting from evils like sex trafficking or pornography or embryonic stem cell research and the like. You don't want to do that. So go to Ethos Logos Investments. That's elinvestments.net slash pints and let them help you invest with character today. Securities offered through Securities America, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC, Ethos Logos Investments, and Securities America are separate entities. Go check them out today. All right. Um, I want to talk to you about icons. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's hard to talk about anything besides what's happening, and I totally, wow. I totally understand that because what do we, like, that's the imagery a good has been so crazy. Like it's the good, imagery of the yeah. of the Capitol takeover was so mad. Nuts. Like it was one of the maddest things that I've seen. The imagery of that shaman with like the horns, you know, walking through the Capitol with like face paint on feels like we're in a video game. That's what it feels like. Yeah, it was gross for sure. How did how did Canadians sort of respond to it? I don't know. I don't. I know how I respond. You don't to get it. out, so you, you haven't spoken don't, to them I, in exactly, months. Exactly, and I don't watch the news because i'm tired of the propaganda so it's hard to even know it's hard to get like i can't watch cbc because i want to wrench if i try to watch cbc here and uh, and it's difficult to find alternative it's a little harder to find the alternative media in canada than you know than in the u.s yeah and we'll see how long they're around for but but honestly though like i was thinking this the other day i was driving in my car and i was listening to some political talk show and i just thought this is not good for me at this point. Like I could be listening to like Bulgarian Orthodox chant or soothing jazz or something, but not this. Like I I know I would be healthier if I just unplugged. Um, That's not to say that we shouldn't kind of keep abreast of these issues and have an idea of what's going on. But at some point it's like, how how much politics can I take in? Mm. And we all, we've all heard the stories of those, you know, fathers and grandmothers who have been told by the doctor, you need to stop watching Fox news, you know, whatever. So, I mean, this kind of comes to the point about talking about iconography and religious things like for you as an, as an artist, not wanting to go insane. I mean, what kind of suggestions do you have for, for Christians like me and others? Yeah, well, it's the same. I think that I have to apply my rules to myself. One of the things I've been doing now, you know, for the, for a little while is I make sure that when I get up in the morning, I pray before I do anything else. Like before I pick up my phone and before I look at my notifications, before any of that, I try to pray before that. Can I and, ask uh, you what you pray? How I just pray the morning like? prayers, the Orthodox uh, morning yeah. prayers. And then I, I, I try to do a little bit of the Jesus prayer, you know, uh, which is these days is not super successful because we're so, we're so, like our minds are so taken up that it, you know, I find myself wandering in my thoughts while I'm doing the Jesus prayer. So uh, hopefully that will get better. But I agree. I've I've had the same since Christmas. I've kind of decided to to break away a little bit and not get not listen to too many political podcasts. Not be too and try to get the bare minimum to at least know what's happening, but not get involved in the commentary and and the infighting. 
But then now recently, because it's the social media world that is being affected itself, because I mean, I'm think it's the same for you in a way. This is my part of my job. You know, yeah. it's like a, when the YouTube videos start to get uh, shadow banned and there starts to be warning on your YouTube videos, then that's affecting me. So I need to. I, it's harder to to uh, to stay neutral and to 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 break off from that. So at least you have a respectable skill like art and carving. I just yell about things I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I can, luckily I can fall back. I'm on, screwed. Like, on yes, yeah. that, that that is true. And I try, like I've been trying to also do that. Uh, I've been doing better. Like get, get up in the morning, pray, beautiful. go carve for like three hours, oh, and then beautiful. after that get into emails and stuff. That way I'm not oh. as frantic as I am when I start right away on the on the emails and the and the social media stuff. Yeah. You're such a talented guy because, I mean, I've been, I've been looking at your... Uh, I'm going to pull it up right now and uh, I'm going to show people some of your carvings. It's absolutely incredible. Did, did you ever kind of, um, you know, as they say, write icons or is it just has it been carving? Is that considered writing? I don't understand. Well, I, I kind of joke because the, the word to write in, uh, in Greek is actually... Uh, it means to incise. And so I think that I win when I say I carve icons that I, ah. you know, that I just carve them. But the, the writing icon things is complicated. I don't like to use that term, but I just carve, I carve, I carve icons. Uh, okay. It's a kind of a marginal art, let's say, in the in the Orthodox tradition. But it is a, it's it it is legitimate, and there are icon carvings, you know, from the beginning, all the way until recently. It's being revived, kind of like icon painting was revived in the mid 20th century, and so. I think that right now icon carving is also being revived by a few people, myself included, and and then a few carvers all over the world. Yeah, I'm showing folks uh, right now what it looks like. It's amazing. I mean, when did you get into this? Well, when I was, I grew up uh, Baptist, yep. Protestant, and then when I was in college, I studied painting, mm -hmm. but I was really struggling to join my theology, which I wanted to take seriously, and the art making. It felt like it just didn't. Uh, jive together. So all my art in college was about image making and the problem of image making as a Protestant and, and in the Western tradition. And so it just became like this weird self-referential thing, which is great for postmodern art, but it's not good for your spiritual health. And so I end, that's one of the things that kind of pushed me towards uh, becoming Orthodox is as I discovered at first medieval art and fell in love with the, let's say, internal language of the church that the church mm. had developed this beautiful uh, sacred visual language that you could find all over Christendom, you know, uh, from Syria to Spain, basically. And so I, I discovered this, and at first I was kind of sad because I thought it was gone and that it wasn't accessible anymore. But then when I discovered iconography and how it was still alive in the Orthodox Church, it was one of the things that led me to uh, to convert. And so I wanted to paint icons, which is what most people want to do. But at that time, it was in 2001, 2002, um, icon painters were very difficult to access. It was hard to find someone to teach you. Mm. And uh, just just happenstance, my parents cut down a tree in their yard and they said, you want to you want to have a go at this? And I thought, I'm going to make a blessing cross. And so that was it. And I was a catechumen Golly. at the time. And then that's kind of what started it all. I see. I'm, I'm showing people right now these kind of a crucifix medallions that you've put together as well. That's amazing. What's that made out of? It looks like stone. So a lot of, yeah, one of the things that I'm carving is uh, steatite. So it's kind of a, a kind of soapstone. Okay. Um, it's an old tradition from the from oh, old Byzantine God. tradition, which kind of went away when Constantinople fell. But I'm trying to revive that because we don't really have access to carving ivory so much anymore. It's, mm. it's very difficult. Yeah. And so the steatite or the stone is a way to, to kind of regain a certain look of uh, ivory and miniature and stuff. Um, and so it's the thing I really like to carve the most, actually. I'm looking at this uh, seat of wisdom uh, statue of our of our blessed mother and our Lord. That is ah, just beautiful. Those were those were someone uh, a few Catholic patrons have asked me to make statues, and statuary isn't usual in the Orthodox tradition. It's hard to fully know exactly why. It has something to do with iconoclasm, and it's not mm -hmm. sure exactly why statuary didn't develop so much in the in the East. But um, so when I, I've had some Catholic patrons asking me to to make statues and I, hmm. I said, I'll do it if you accept that I try to kind of integrate it's kind of yeah. Eastern iconographic language in the statue. And so it was a interesting little game to play between the statue and this the, the more, let's say, kind of medieval, but at the same time looking more Eastern. I, I actually prefer it a lot more. And I've been thinking about why that is the case. You know, I've been going to a Byzantine church now for about six years. Um, 
and and I think it's I don't know what it is, but like here's how I here I, here's how I explain it. If somebody took a photo of a beautiful woman, say dressed up like the Theotokos, I wouldn't want to use that um, in 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 a you know while praying. And I think a lot of people would agree. Like, well, yeah, no, like you don't want someone who like looks like Jenny down the road. Um, and and statues kind of have that. They, they they they. I mean, I know icons can look tacky if they're not well done. I think statues have a better likelihood of looking tacky. But I actually really like this of the Theotokos. It's it's kind of, yeah, it is a really beautiful blend between east, east and well, east and west, I guess. Mm. And if you you they look a little bit. I tried to make them look a little bit like the seat of wisdom statuary that was yeah. popular in the 11th, 12th century in the West as well. Tried to find, trying to recapture you know the strength of the medieval Christian art, you know, in oh, a in a way that is surprising at the same time. Golly, this is outstanding. I'm just clicking around and showing people what they look like. This one of our blessed Lord. What does that mean in Greek? I think it's Greek. Pantocrator. Is that the it means the ruler of all, the, oh. the Lord of all. Yeah. Okay. It's usually it's the image that you find in the dome of the church, for example. Right. So it's like Christ coming back at the at the last judgment. Gosh, that's beautiful. So as you had this sort of um, conversion, if you want, to the Orthodox Church, did you find? We, I mean, were you a serious Baptist as a child? Yes, I would say so. I was very involved in the youth groups and, the, you know, I was kind of artistic. And so in my young adulthood, I wrote a lot of plays that were performed and kind of toured around Quebec, you know, kind cool. of evang evangelical, these big evangelical type plays. So I was quite involved, but I would it was really at least starting in my tw early 20s, I would say it, it became like a, a crisis, really like a major crisis in terms of the depth of uh, of the understanding, but also the problem of art. Um, and so that's really, it was really kind of my desire to find coherence that led me to, to the, to the Orthodox church and reading the church fathers, especially St. Gregory of Nyssa, mm. um, and, uh, ultimately St. Maximus, the confessor, just like, I, that was it. Like I found really the power of the Chris, the Christian worldview, you would say, I felt like I discovered, I felt like I'd grown up in a world where scientism was the worldview and Christianity was like this weird arbitrary revelation on top of it. Whereas in discovering the church fathers, I discovered that there's, there's actually the shape of the world is Christian. And Ooh, it's, and the, the scripture it. actually describes how the world is like how it, how it appears to us. And so, so I, I, I really fell in love with that. That's beautiful. Um, what's it been like, you know, I know you've given some lectures on the same platform as people like Brett Weinstein and, and Jordan Peterson. What's it like kind of discussing the faith with people who may, or may not have a sort of more of a secular mindset, so they can appreciate Christianity for what what it's given us, but they they hold to a form of religion while denying its power. Yeah, H how's that been for you? Well, it's it's really been a surprise to be honest, because it, before I met Jordan Peterson, I was mostly talking inside, right? So I was talking about Christian symbolism to Orthodox, and just describing symbol symbolism and icons and all this stuff. So for years, I ran. Uh, I was editing a, a journal called the Orthodox Art Journal with other people. Um, and so when Jordan kind of threw me out there, like he just kind of threw me out into the public, I, I encountered this secular crowd. And I tried to find ways to talk about these things in a way that would be understandable to secular yes. people. Yes. And, um, and I, I mean, I've been really surprised to see that, you know, there are a lot of people that are staying on the secular side, but I've seen thousands of people convert to Christianity, you know, because they're at the end of the nihilism, they're at the end of the, of the, you know, of this kind of weird post modern postmodern world that has been given to them. And they're at the end of scientism as well. And so mm -hmm. they, I, I've seen a lot of people finally understand, at least under, because one of the problems we've had is that people don't know what Christianity is talking about. You know, a lot of a lot of times they think it's just a kind of either it's a kind of moralism or it's yeah. a kind of arbitrary thing that if you don't believe this, you go to hell, you know, that kind of nonsense. Yeah. But when people start discovering that it's actually discussing about this, talking about the structure of reality and it's it's, it's discussing how reality exists and how you need to engage with reality, uh, then then they they're surprised and they're excited that, you know, that this is still available to them. Yeah, I think that's why Jordan Peterson has been something of a gateway drug into Christianity for many people who have abandoned the faith as kids. He, yeah. he kind of helped it become intelligible to them in a way that they hadn't seen before. They they didn't realize it was that sophisticated. They just 
I don't know, maybe thought it had something to do with people who denied evolution or something. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, it's also because of the, it was kind of like the new atheist moment, which took over in, yeah. in the popular culture, you know, and it, 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 I don't know if it really took over in the high intellectual spheres, but it definitely took over popular culture. And so you could have a, a barely, a, you know, a somewhat intelligent, not super smart person who had all the arguments laid out of how, how stupid religion is and how all these contradictions in scripture, all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, and how it doesn't fit with science. But then it's, it's also because they were facing a bunch of people who are trying to read science into Genesis one, Yeah, which is, which is so, so then these two things that face each other create this weird, monstrous cultural moment where we think that that's what Christians believe. And then there are actually some Christians who do think that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so they've sort of never encountered traditional Christianity before these people. Yeah. Like you, you, you meet a uh, like a kind of debunker, and they talk about what most Christians believe, and what they mean by most Christians isn't most Christians. No, I know it's like they mean it's like Bible Belt, like this very narrow strip yeah. of, of of. And I of, find I find the most the most. I mean, I know there are a lot of very rational, fantastic atheists. I get it, but I think the most kind of uh, angry ones tend to be people who kind of grew up in a fundamentalist home. You know, yeah. they talk about how they grew up Christian, and you're like, ugh, that doesn't. The kind of Christianity you're describing that you grew up with doesn't actually sound like something I would I would get on board with either. Yeah, and I mean, most the biggest Christian group is Catholic in the world. It's not it's not this this fundamentalist group and and Catholicism and yeah. But Orthodox then we we have our own baggage, right? With the craziness going on, with all this talk of pedophilia and yeah. something the Pope said about something that he may have been taken. I mean, so we have our own way of <laughs> making Christianity as a whole look suspect. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but that's there's a difference between there's a difference between let's say the worldview and the doctrinal positions, which are something, and then there are the the kind of hypocrisy that you find in, yeah. in any any group, any world, and and the, you know the kind of the traitors that we find within the hierarchical structure, you know. And so I think that it's important to be able to differentiate that because totally, you know. It, but it just not, gives people an easy way to dismiss you. Like if I want yeah. to dismiss you, and then I find out you're you have hypocrites in the ranks, easy done. I take the moral high ground. I look super great. I get to point to your immorality while yeah. you've been trying to tell me to be moral, you know. And and it's also yeah. it's easy because because Catholicism is such a hierarchical structure, you can point to anybody, let's say anybody who has any authority in the in the Catholic Church and say that's Catholic and so yeah. and you can kind of incriminate the entire this entire one of the biggest institutions in the history of the world, probably the biggest, yeah. and incriminate the entire institution because of Oh, the fact that in that massive billion people institution, there are some people who are using it to their own perverse advantage. Yeah, I've often said, you know, if you're if you're looking for a perfect church, as soon as you join it, it won't be like suppose you were to have found it. You join it. Have you met you? You're disgusting. It'll be awful. You know, it's <laughs> like it's yeah, it's a lot easier, I guess, if you've got a you know, small church down the road with 10 people to try to keep you all together. But when you've got a billion plus. You're going to find hypocrites for sure. So one of the, one of the things I've done in, in my work in the past is I've written on the topic of pornography, and I've just found it really interesting because it's definitely in my history. Uh, it's something I'm tempted to from time to time. It's something I hate, um, but I see the appeal of it. I see how it's kind of dragging people um, into hell and into just a kind of boring, monotonous existence that they, they don't want to be in, but they feel mm. they have no no choice to be in. And I just wanted to chat with you about that because I've had this idea, which isn't terribly insightful, but I think it is accurate, that pornography is like the anti-icon. So if the icon sort of kind of brings us into this larger reality, pornography does the opposite. It suppresses the personhood of the performer and sort of hollows her out or him out, as it were, and yeah. leaves us with less than what's there. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a there's a very good... It's a very interesting to differentiate, let's say... The, the the idea of the icon and the, the pornographic image, because the pornographic image is probably one of the closest places where we could find idolatry today in terms of understanding what ancient idols were actually were, which is that you create an image or you create a, a statue or an image, and then that statue becomes a vehicle, right? It becomes a kind of vehicle for some demon like some spirit which 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 and then your encounter with that spirit is is going to bring you something right 
and it and pornography plays exactly that role like if you don't believe in incubi incubi and succubi like you're an idiot because that's exactly what pornography is doing you're not encountering the person right like you said they become hollowed out shells and they become they become vehicles for your mm. passion and then mm -hmm. ultimately vehicles for these you know let's say the way in which your passion that mode of being links together with others is through a kind of principality which is driving this whole thing, right? Because your passion isn't driving the industry of pornography, but all the passions of people brought together and kind of as this strange entity is what's driving this thing. And and so the the pornographic image becomes a becomes a place where that manifests itself, and it leads to a form of ecstasy, just like mm -hmm. a, an idol like an idol would. It leaves it can give you something, like it gives you some momentary power or some momentary ecstasy. But then, yes. like you said because it is it is ultimately an idol and it, it's not connected to to god like an icon like an icon of a, like when you meet a saint or you meet a holy person that person is actually revealing christ to you you know in the opposite way then pornography is breaking you away from what the true purpose of sexuality is what the true purpose of love and relationship is um and so it's it's a it's a it really is like you said a kind of anti-icon yeah, I mean, if we think of like an icon as, I mean, how would you define icon? Just as a well, the word that icon is, something else? is a is just means sacred image. Like it's it, image, the word icon right. just means image, but it's usually shorthand for holy icon, which is that you have a sacred image, uh, and a sacred image. What it does is it it reminds us first of all that God gave us renewed the image that He had placed in us, like renewed the image of Himself. Uh, that he had put in Adam, he renewed it in Christ. And so the image of Christ participates in the way that God reveals himself to us. Um, and then the images of the saints, they also remind us and they help us participate in the fact right. that we're all together in this this church. We're all together in this body, this cosmic body, which is moving towards the eschaton. Um, and so that's what icons do. So when you look at an icon of a saint, you're you're this, it's presencing the saint to you, but behind that, it's also presencing right. Christ to you. Just like when you meet a person, right? You know, and that, that's that, that's kind of what I wanted to get to. You know, it, it, I'm not sure if you've heard of Anthony Esselin or not, but he's an excellent thinker. He has he has this quote of his. He says, "We sense that the human body is a precious thing, worthy of our reverence. It is not a tool." not an object of consumption like a steak or a keg of beer, yep. not an animate provider of pleasure. It is the outward expression of a profound mystery, that of another human being. Um, and that's the evil of pornography right there. It, uh, yeah, we, we choose, it's almost like it does what death does in an analogous way. It separates body and soul and says, I just want this. No, and, you're exactly yeah. right. It, mm. it it really does. It is a cleaving. It, it, it's like a cleaving of the person. And especially because we already get a little bit of that just in the technological image itself. Like it's a dangerous game we play with these screens. It's already a danger. But when mm. when that, let's say when that danger gets brought to the extreme through this kind of explicit sexual act and also the kind of raw, how can I say this? The the nudity of shame, you could say, you know, where you you have the permission to look at something which is meant to be secret and meant to be holy. Like it's 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 a desacralization of something which is meant to be to be holy. Uh, and so all of that brought together is exactly what you said. It turns the body into pure meat, pure object of desire. Um, and uh, and it's not even the body. It's like an image. It's like this deincarnated image. Like right? it's like this. It's it is. It's almost like this. Like I said, it almost is like a like a subtle body in the in the very traditional sense, which manifests itself to you of these these kind of demonic demonic forces. Oh wow, well, yeah. Well, let me let me just kind of unspool here a little bit about my opinion on the difference between pornography and naked art, and then I would love you as an artist to kind of help me kind of flesh this out a little bit, right? Because um, you know the word pornography entered the English language in the mid nineteenth century it comes from two Greek words, which means the writing or drawing of the prostitutes. And it's clear that the the kind of creators, the producers of pornography mean for their product to interact with the consumer in the way that a 
prostitute would. So pornography is always meant to be a substitute for a prostitute. You know, I was just thinking, like in this crazy lockdown time that we're in, if you were a prostitute and had to work online, what would that look like? Well, it would be pornography because yeah. I think one of the primary maybe the only notable difference between pornography and prostitution is that there is a camera in the room. Um, but with naked art, it's something altogether different. You know, you don't find people sort of being tempted to masturbate in the Sistine Chapel. You don't find them going to some beautiful art museum and 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 finding that temptation. And yet you see the body and all of its beauty, the breasts and the genitals, and it, this is all lovely. And it seems like, though, you're being drawn into an interior world. There's, mm. there's something going on. There is a complexity and interiority to the person. Um where is I mean, it? I don't. I, yeah. I tend to be not on. I'm not on the on this. Let's say I. I don't mind the fact that nudity exists in the art, but it's it's definitely to me like when nudity started to reintegrate art. Let's say in the during the Renaissance, and later, it seemed to me like it's a it was a a strange pagan move. Oh, really? Uh, because if you if you read the if you read the early councils when they they accepted images in the church, and when you read how the church fathers talk about one of the reasons why icons look the way they do is because Roman art was erotic. Roman art was extremely erotic. And so what the Christians did is they took the Roman forms and they, if you look at the figures, they're using Roman tropes. Everything about iconography is based on Roman tropes. The, the you know, the, the, the fold, the clothing, mm -hmm. every, the poses, even the contrapposto, all of this comes from Roman statuary and Roman painting, but it was de-eroticized. And so the, all the figures are covered and then the contrapposto is adjusted slightly so that it's not as sensual. So all of it, there's like a, and you can read, I think it was he's even uh, St. Basil, I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. Sure. But one of the fathers talked about how, you know, the, the images that are represented in the church have to be not to, not to attract attention to your desires. Like they need to be, they need to have a sobriety to them so that you're not tempted by them. Um, and so I do think that because like in the Sistine Chapel, you even the Sistine Chapel now that it's been restored, but it didn't take long for the nuns to paint thing vines over the over the genitals, which were you know, removed. They, now they've been removed by John Paul but, II, which I thought was that's cool that we disagree on this because I think that I, I think I disagree with you on that. I yeah. think that I mean whatever we might say of Christian tradition and the fathers and their opinions, I mean the the argument that that one would make uh, would be that the body can be portrayed in a way. Uh, that is decent and good or not. And so would your argument be that you actually can't portray the body through drawing or painting in a way that... Um... I think that it, I think that the best way that I would understand that is mostly that the body or the naked body is has two aspects to it. There are two nakednesses, you could say, and those, those are related to the story in Genesis. Like one is the nudity in the garden and it's the nudity in... Uh, the secret place where you're you're in communion with God, and then that when at the fall that nudity gets turned into the nudity of shame, and in the outside of the garden then you cover yourself, and so I think that that duality remains the same, and so I think there is of course like you said an absolute dignity and beauty and power mm -hmm. to the human body, but there's something of the altar in that in that that power. There's something of the sacredness of the body, which needs to be preserved and hidden mm -hmm. uh, for the moment of the bride and the groom, like for the for the the encounter of the bride and the groom in the hidden chamber. And so that's kind of more the way that I I so understand you, it. So the your idea would be that since the time of the fall, it is no longer appropriate to depict the body naked. Well, I would say that it's hard to depict it naked without the shame. And so that's why Christ was represented not fully naked on the cross, but let's say as naked as possible. And it was somewhat scandalous even when it started, Christ started to appear that way. On the cross, Christ was represented fully clothed until like the early, let's say, I didn't even know what the first time, the, I think it was in the ninth century around the time of Charlemagne that Christ started to appear as naked on the cross or as almost naked. And I think that it was meant to represent the nakedness of shame. It was meant to, to the, the nakedness or a way in a way you could say joining the nakedness of shame with the nakedness in the garden in a very strange, very mm. surprising way, the way Christ unites opposites and extremes together. But 
but that was one of the only places where that where the kind of the body was shown was when Christ was was dead on the cross and I would say that it's mostly that it has to do with the secret it has to do with a mystical reality which is still kept you could you could say something like I imagine that in paradise we'll all be naked right like in in the kingdom maybe or clothed in glory the way the we father's talking about Nike. <laughs> we won't be wearing Nike that's for sure <laughs> or clothed in glory the way the 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 uh, fathers talk about uh, the nakedness of the garden, something like that. What's your opinion on those beautiful breastfeeding Madonna icons? Ah, I don't know. I think I think that they, I think that they start out okay, and then they get more and more disturbing. You know, and, and by then disturbing, as, do you mean sensual, like I think leading they to sexual? Yeah, definitely. I think that in the Baroque period, there is a there's a there's a kind of sensuality. Like you look at a Rubens painting, and it's just it's just all, it's very sensual. I mean, the bodies what, what's are- that, what's, he, what's that called? Sorry, I want to look it up. A Rubens, so R-U-B-E- I shouldn't look it up, I guess. Rubens, what would I type, painting? Yeah, Rubens painting. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, I see what you mean, how they become yeah. more sensual. Well, I, let's, I, I don't want to put a pin in that, I do want to keep fleshing that out, but just kind of back up a little bit. You know, I suppose when we talk about, um, you know, pornography, you know, you, you could talk about it from different angles, right? Like there's the one who produces the pornography. There is the one who quote unquote performs in the pornography. Then you have the consumer, right? And I suppose, in fact, I would say it's, it is the case that one can look at pornography and not sin because, you know, you, we have these sort of police officers who have to say, look at images of child pornography in order to identify victims and catch these people. Mm -hmm. uh, or you might f have a, a mother, say, who accidentally stumbles upon what a child has been seeing and, and scrolls through to, to understand it. You know, I would say that this, because of the intention of the, the viewer watching pornography, while it may always be harmful to some degree, you, one isn't always culpable for it. Yeah. But, but I... Um, and I suppose it's possible that someone could look, as you say, upon these Reuben paintings or even the icon of the breastfeeding Madonna and feel lust uh, and have their sexual, their, their, their sort of lower passion stirred up. Um, but I've always thought, I guess, that, you know, especially in regards to, the, say, the icon or even the Sistine Chapel, that the problem wasn't with the art. It wasn't with depicting the body, which is good. It, it's always been with the, the, the person, that there's a problem in the heart if I am to look upon something holy like the breastfeeding Madonna icon and feel lust. That that's not a problem with the depiction. It's, it's the problems with, with me. But No, I think you're, I think you're, on to, I think you're on to the you're right in, the, in an absolute sense. But I, I, I still nonetheless think that it's a dangerous it's a yeah, dangerous see, I, I think uh, I see what you mean hill to slide because, down because at the very least like let's say one says you can depict the body in a responsible way which I'm not uh, it sounds like you're leaning towards not necessarily after the after the garden right but but even if that were the case um, there's the temptation of like leading people into sin because there are people who are seriously perverted and so maybe maybe that's an argument for why you shouldn't just be having these <laughs> these naked images in churches um I mean, I am definitely a traditional iconographer, so I don't advocate for the <laughs> naked people in churches. But sure. if you look at, for example, the way that nakedness is portrayed, like so I was trying, as, that we were, as we were talking, I was trying to think of other scenes where the saints are represented naked. And it, mm. does, it does happen. And it's usually uh, ascetics. Like ascetics are sometimes represented naked. Yeah, Mary uh, of Egypt. Yes, yeah, and Mary of Egypt is is sometimes represented naked in a way where she's an almost a skeleton. Yeah. Like she's, she's a barely... She barely has any flesh on her, and so there is a way in, in which the nakedness of the aesthetic is is also this weird place where scandal and glory come together. You know, like you can imagine when um, Saint Francis of Assisi would disrobe or ask his his Franciscans to disrobe uh, before the in public. Like it wasn't it was obviously not to entice their entice other people's sexual desire but it was rather for the person to kind of descend into that shame of nakedness mm. in a way that would liberate them from the liberate them from that shame in a way yeah i don't know of that particular story um oh that saint francis would disrobe. i mean i I've, I've heard stories of you know people that maybe francis rolling in the snow or these sorts of things to avoid temptation but is it the case that francis asked some of his brothers to actually strip naked 
Yeah, well, Francis himself did it. And so Francis, when Francis kind of, uh, he started giving his father's money to uh, right. to build a church. And then they brought That's him right. from so his father. It, so and he they said, said, from now on, our father who art in heaven. Yeah. Right? And so he took his, he disrobed and he gave his cloak to to his father to the priest that was there and but then he also asked some of his brothers to do the same at some points and this probably doesn't mean undergarments right though i'm sure he's not like i don't know yeah i don't because if that were the case i mean far be it from me to criticize a saint but i'd be like that doesn't seem cool francis yeah but um i guess i can see well the holy fools the holy fools are capable of engaging in this kind of Hmm. scandalous behavior uh but they take the consequences for it but it's also it is this weird moment like i said where this strange moment where the, the the nakedness of Christ on the cross is both the nakedness of scandal and the, the return to the garden at the same time. So I just really want to understand your argument. So forgive me for, for going back to this. So is your argument, and, and maybe you haven't fully thought this through, so I'm not, I'm not pressing right. you on it or anything, but it, it seems to be like prior to the fall, one could look upon another body and, and see it in all of its glory and splendor and without wanting to use the body. But since the time of we, we've left the garden, that's no longer possible. And so we shouldn't depict nudity in art. Well, it's, I don't think we should depict it in a sensual manner, at least not at least not in the church art, at least not. In no, church I agree. Art. But then but I wouldn't consider like I wouldn't consider the, the, the nudity in the Sistine Chapel to be sensual in any sense. Like, I yeah. agree that that those Reuben paintings were sensual from what yeah. I saw. Um, so would you say though that you can depict nudity, um, in a non-sensual way that would be appropriate or are you kind of skeptical of that? I mean, I think that, that people have done it on the, with Christ on the cross forever. And so, I mean, without, without necessarily showing Christ's genitalia, that Christ is, is ba- basically. But I would be open to that. I would be open to a beautiful icon sh- displaying Christ's genitalia. Mm. And I would see, I would, I would, until this conversation would have thought that would have been appropriate or could be appropriate. <laughs> I don't know. I think that I, I, I'm not sure. I, I get the sense that that one might be disclosing the disclosing the 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 secret in a way that might not be appropriate in the public. I would say something. Say it that way. Because he was crucified naked by, yes. by all accounts, right? I think that's probably so, he probably was completely naked. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is really fascinating. Feel free to feel free to expand on this if if I'm not giving you enough time to flesh yeah. out your thoughts. But I, that's what I that's what I think. I think that if you look at the story of art, you'll notice that when the from the Roman period to the Christian period, there was a transformation in the way that the body was represented. Mm. And you can see that there's a, a use of all the Roman tropes, but transformed into a more sober vision of the human person, which focuses on the face, especially this encounter with the person, right? Because you encounter someone in their eyes, in their face, in their mm-hmm. expression. And so you can see that that's where the art towards what the art went and um and then during the renaissance which which i mean this is this would be a big argument to have but i think the renaissance is a is a return to paganism at least for a little moment uh during the renaissance then there's this return to nakedness uh in in art and also Mm -hmm. a return to a lot of the pagan subjects right you know Mm -hmm. if you look at the way that that Michelangelo represents God. It's basically Zeus, right? I mean, who is this figure? Like, who is this bearded guy? Like, who? I'm not sure who. Who is this bearded guy that's touching Adam? Is it Christ? Like, who is it? Is it it's, God? It's is God it the Father. The Father. It's the Father. Right. Yeah. It's so God until the then, like until the 14th century, God the Father was never represented in art. Interesting. You know, it's or funny. if so, like very, very freak events. But it, it's like during all the Middle Ages, the father was never represented because you don't represent God. Well, that's interesting. You, you know, what's interesting is um, I heard Dr. William Lane Craig, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah. He was asked a question about iconography, you know, and I've got my standard responses, right, to Protestants who tell me I'm not allowed to kind of depict yeah. things in heaven and earth. Um, and it was interesting because he said that. He gave one of the responses I've given, right? And he said, well, you know, the second person of the Blessed Trinity and becoming man made an icon of himself. And so he can see an argument for that. But he he holds to what you just said, that you shouldn't be making an icon of God the Father. But that's interesting because I'm in trouble if that is true, right? (laughs) Because I belong to a tradition which does often um, depict God in that way. Yeah, well, less and less. And even in the Orthodox Orthodox tradition, if you look at, 
in starting in the 15th, 16th century, there starts to be images of God the Father that are represented. At first, they kind of try to fudge it by <laughs> representing, uh, they call him the, the Ancient of Days. And so they show the Ancient of Days and then the, the in the vision of Daniel where he gives his power to the Son of Man. And so they represent like Christ with white hair and then also Christ as a as a child on his lap. So they try to fudge it, but then that figure of the Ancient of Days finally becomes God the Father, and they start representing God the Father in iconography. But now modern iconographers, there I know almost no modern iconographer that represents God the Father. I, I, I could probably not even count them on one hand. And, and what would you say the argument for that is? The argument is for that why you shouldn't we still I mean. respect the second commandment. In the sense, we under, we respect the notion that you cannot represent God but through Christ, because Christ is the image that God gave to us. And so we can see God in Christ, but we cannot see God directly outside of the Logos. Like, you can't see God the Father. No. Like, every theophany in the Old Testament is, is the Logos. Like, you even have this idea, for example, that when, when God says, I am the one that is, it's yeah. Christ. That's why in the halo of Christ, I, uh, I, yeah. Orthodox people would often write the one that is, I right? Have it up there, yeah. yeah. So the yeah. the one the one who is is basically saying, you know, that vision that Moses had, that's what he saw. He saw Christ. He saw the divine logos. Huh. I'd have to think more about that. What about when Moses sees the back of God? Are you saying that's Christ too? I mean, I would say he hasn't become incarnate at this point. So why does it matter? Why do you have to say it's the Son? Well, because the Son is the principle of manifestation of of the of the Trinity, right? The 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 Son is that by which all things are made, but it's yep. ultimately also that by which all things appear, right? All the mm. qualities, all the names, all come through the Son, and so all categories of existence are manifested through the Son. What does that mean? All categories of existence. Say that. Well, they, what does that mean? That means that everything that exists yeah. is revealed or manifested through the Son. Okay, I don't know what that means, manifested. Because I'm thinking of John 1, where it says nothing came to be except through him. That's right. But what does that so mean? That's a good way. That by him, by, by, so God created the world through the divine logo. So the, the logos, or the, the word, is the means by which God reveals himself into creation. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, I think so. Say it again. <laughs> so, so, so the in, oh, so let's use let's use secular terms. So, so the infinite. <laughs> Remember that episode the of The Office where the Michael Scott says, "Explain this to me like I'm five. Just that's kind of what <laughs> the, I'm. The what I'm unbounded saying. infinite that is beyond all category, totally and beyond all name and 100%. all limit and all anything, all comprehension. Yep, all comprehension manifests himself through a, a concentrating point a son like his that he engenders and that son now and i'm not in secular talk anymore i i, I said i'm going to stay in secular <laughs> talk and then and then so then that's how so it's like this you can imagine the infinite and mm -hmm. then through the logos and the world starts to manifest the category so the difference between christianity and any other religion because that idea is there in a lot of other traditions but the difference is that we say that the logos is co-eternal with the father mm -hmm. that we don't think that the divine logos is created we right. think that the divine logos is uncreated and therefore the world creation is called to participate in god because the way by which it's made is not lower than god it's not like mm -hmm. a lower stage than god so when god speaks it's him and through his speech then all things appear mm -hmm. So this idea, for example, like, so Christians could never have this idea that creation is bad, could never have this idea that right. creation in itself is fallen because the means by which God creates is God. Including, not, the, naked, including the naked body. Including the naked body. <laughs> <laughs> in a hierarchy, in a hierarchy of being. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a smart ass. I was just saying, like, that's true, right? Like, because, like, yeah. I mean, you do have, like, strands of Christians that, you know, speak of the body or speak of sex or speak of sexual desire in an anti-body way. Mm. Well, for sure, there is there is a strand of, of Gnosticism, which is yeah. just always there in Christianity. This idea that the world 
is fallen in itself, that like you said, the body is evil in itself or that sexuality is evil in itself. Whereas the the traditional way of understanding and the right way of understanding is that that all things ultimately point to God if they're in their proper place. Yeah. It's just about things being in the right place. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Man. All right. Thank you. I have to. I have to listen to my own podcast and think that through again. That was really cool. I appreciate you. Uh, How do we get? We started with pornography and got to to like talking about that. Well, that's a much. That's that's uh, that, that's the Which way. That's the way you want to go. You don't want to start you, from art and go to pornography. Um, hey, I've heard some people say that icons can be therapeutic, not just therapeutic, but kind of healing. They can kind of heal the wound that pornography has created. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, obviously, I think it's a beautiful thing to stare upon icons. But uh, what would you say to that? Someone who says, you know, I was looking at pornography. It really messed me up. And so to help heal me of that, I just started sitting before icons. I mean, I think it's possible. I would say, thank God, if that's the case, you know, I I don't. I wouldn't see it as a formula. Like I. Yeah. No, no, nor would I. That's what I'm having trouble. That's what I'm having yeah. trouble with. Because it sounds really pious, but I'm like, I don't see how that could, like, just do this and then this will happen. I think that's true. No. I don't think there's any silver bullet at all. You know. No. But, exactly. It's like confession yeah. and fight and pray and fall and get back and pray and confess and I mean, what else? Like that's life. You know. That's just yeah. how it works. Yeah. Cool. All right. <laughs> What else should we talk about? <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to talk about? Uh, I mean, t tell me a little bit because I, I know a little bit about, you know, who are you talking to? Like, who are the people that who are, do you feel is your audience when you're talking to people? Uh, who is I, I guess I, I, I think that Catholicism is true and I want to help people understand the Catholic faith through a sort of Thomistic lens. I did my undergrad and master's in philosophy and a lot of it was Thomistic philosophy. I love Thomas Aquinas and... Uh, uh, very often on our show, we'll kind of like take a text from the Sumer or some other commentary of his and just sort of look at it. Um, he's a very clear thinker. He writes almost syllogistically, you know. Mm. He 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 steel mans. I'm not sure if you've heard of that term, have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he steel mans his opponent's arguments. And so it's just always interesting, you know. Like in the Sumer, he'll present arguments. I know you know this, but for those who don't, he'll present arguments against the position he wants to make and then he'll make his position then respond to those arguments. But then there are other works of his. I have one over on my shelf here. It's called De Malo on Evil, where he'll present up to like 20 arguments against the position he wants to make and then respond to those. And, and not in a way that you feel like he's straw manning the position. I, I just find that really intellectually honest. And it, I know I'm sure I fail at it, but it's something I try to do as I consider mm. opposing, uh, opposing ideas, you know. So, yeah, I guess yeah, that, I that's who I speak to. More and more we have orthodox... Christians who, who who are viewing the channel, but I'd say probably a lot of Protestants and a lot of confused Catholics, right? Who are just, we're all going through, I'm sure this is true in the Orthodox Church churches too, right? We're all going through this turbulent time. It feels mm. like there's this division, you know, not mm. just in politics, um, but in religions, right? Where you've got the people who are identifying as the traditionalists and then the soy boys, what, <laughs> it's probably not what they identify as, but like, it's like, it feels like this is splitting apart every kind of group and I, I i think there's just a lot of kind of confusion and this desire to find something to anchor themselves to and that is jesus christ and the scriptures and the and the patristics and the liturgy mm. you know but yeah yeah i think that i mean i think it's wonderful because you're right there is such a i think there's such a chaos like we're we're definitely going through a, a period of intense chaos of of strange upside down things you know happening and and it's it's infecting the church and I, it's everywhere you know it's for sure i would say in the orthodox uh church because it's so slow it's not as prevalent but it's coming and you can see it coming and you can see all the the kind of uh the, the same type of conflict that you find you know mm -hmm. in the western christianity are starting to kind of come into the orthodox tradition well one question I had for you is, and I know you're a Baptist who became Orthodox, is sometimes I see a lot of vitriol online from Orthodox people towards Catholics. Mm. And I don't know if it's like the, the kind of big brother syndrome where you just hate whatever's bigger than you. And um, it's kind of like why New Zealand hates Australia, but we're like, they're cute. They're fine. We love them. You know, I don't know if there's that thing going on. or But I, I suspect there's a lot of Protestant converts who may have had an anti-Catholic sort of bias and brought that into orthodoxy. I'm not saying there aren't things to critique yeah. in Catholicism. And if you're orthodox, you, you, you're you right to kind of reject what you believe to be false. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that makes you anti-Catholic or anything like that. 
Um, but yeah, I'm just but, wondering how that's changing the kind of landscape of orthodoxy in North America, or if you've noticed that. I think, I mean, I think that the, the let's say the hostility towards Catholicism that you find in orthodoxy has a long story. And because <laughs> yeah. like, and so because orthodox are also very slow, slow moving, you know, it's like you talk to orthodox people, like they're, they're still living in the fourth century. Like to them, the arguments that were happening in the fourth century are still live right yes, now. Yes. <laughs> and so because of that, there really is this sense that the Crusades happened not that long ago. And, you know, and not just the Crusades, but then also the Holy Roman Empire and the, the, the you know, the kind of taking over of uh, certain Orthodox lands in the modern time. So all of that is is very prevalent in the way people thinking, because Eastern Europe is that place where the two political mm. aspects of the of Christianity just kind of constantly were in battle. And so mm -hmm. you have countries that were Orthodox before they became Catholic, and then some that have this weird, you know, this, the, and then there's the, the kind of, like you said, Eastern Catholics that are kind of in between, but they're not on one side and not on the other. And so because of that, I think that's why you get the hostility. Um, but, you know, I, myself, I don't, I'm not interested in that stuff. I'm just, I don't find it interesting because I feel like the world is falling apart, to be honest. It, uh, so much is happening that, you know, I think we can we can recognize the differences we have, acknowledge the differences, but then also understand that on most fronts, we're yeah. on the same side. On most fronts of what's going on in the world, we're on the, we're on the same side. And there's also a strange thing which is happening, which is that you start to notice, for example, that the, let's say the line, the battle lines or the, the cultural lines are going across different Christian groups. And so you end up having people who are serious about their faith and take it seriously in their life and in the way they view the world and want to use their faith as a lens for how they perceive reality. And you see that across all different denominations. Yeah. And then you have people in all the same denominations who, who desperately want to be accepted by the world, who desperately want to be progressive and to kind of change the way that Christians understand things in order to adapt to the modern world. And then you see those also all across the denominations. And so sometimes you end up, sometimes I end up feeling more sympathy with a Catholic or a Baptist or even a Pentecostal who, who, who takes scripture seriously, who takes Christ seriously, then another Orthodox who like who woke, just wants to be accepted Orthodox. by the UN or whatever, who just wants to be loved by the yeah. you know by the popular thinking. So yeah, that's that's interesting. And I, you know, in in Catholicism right now, because we had this big reform right of the liturgy um, after the Second Vatican Council, and now there's this like desire to return to our tradition, which I'm mm -hmm. all in favor of. And I wonder if there's like an awkwardness in that, you know, like tradition is meant to be this thing that's passed on. That's almost second nature. Mm. It's, it's kind of weird when you have to like grab and artificially impose upon yourself and your way of life, a tradition that wasn't yours. Uh, and maybe that's just what we have to do until it becomes second nature again. But I think that's one of the most thing, you know, things Catholics love about our Orthodox brothers and sisters. That they, they never had that same sort of, that same sort of, uh, yeah, uh, change in, in the liturgy you guys have your tradition and that really feels stable i mean this has been the line i keep saying like in a time of chaos you seek you seek stability if there's a storm outside you go to wherever feels safest <laughs> and 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 that can that can mean tradition in a healthy way but i guess it could also mean a sort of a, a kind of awkward white knuckling sort of um rigid rigidity too i mean yeah, you need, it's it's hard to find the balance when the world is kind of pushing you in a direction. And I I, yeah. I sympathize for people who kind of kind of buckle down and kind of hold on. Um, but it can be it can be its own idol, of course. At the yeah, same time, yeah. if you're not careful, because you you know we always have to we always have to remember that Christ both you know both uh, would would uh, criticize the Pharisees for for not embodying the law properly. But then he would also talk to Samaritans and, you know, and, and yeah. he would talk to heretics. You know, he didn't stop himself. If you understand that Samaritans were heretics at the time of Christ, then all of a sudden a lot of a lot of you mm. can understand the, the, the possibility of engaging with people that are that you feel don't aren't right on every point of view. You know, it, anyway, so I, I, I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of the hyper traditionalists. I find that they that they kind of sometimes miss the essential 
but I'm also definitely not a fan of the super progressive yeah, type. Yeah, I'm with you. To, yeah. I'm with you. I'm more sympathetic to the hyper traditionalists because I yeah. feel like I, I can see what they're reaching for. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, man, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Hey, are you aware of, of these kind of Western Orthodox folks who celebrate one of the Western liturgies in, but, but who are Orthodox? Yeah, they they've always struggle to find their place. Like they're they. I think it's an interesting idea. It's, I, I, I mean, it's I, probably I, like me. It's probably like yeah. me, right? Who's like adopting all of these Eastern traditions? Who goes to divine liturgy? It's it's an awkward place to be. And I yeah. heard someone say it's it's like being the child of divorced parents. You just <laughs> feel kind of out of sorts, out of place. I think most of the people who are Western Orthodox are kind of ex Anglicans. Yeah. who who kind of have a desire for Anglo-Catholicism, uh, can't have it in them to, let's say, convert to Catholicism. Yeah. And so and so they, they end up becoming Orthodox, but wanting to keep their kind of Anglo, you know, Anglo-Catholic liturgy. And there's also like a weird Neo-Celtic uh, thing in there, like a, a kind of idea of Celtic spirituality and... And so, so now, what, it's, now it's, what makes that weird? Because that sounded pejorative, right? Because I, I, I kind of feel like if Anglicanism hadn't split from Catholicism, the Catholicism you would have today would actually be less Roman and more Celtic in an appropriate sense. Not uh, in the a way, at least, way. that my understanding of the West, the Western Orthodox, uh, is that they have a sense that the the Ang let's say the Celtic Church was colonized by Rome, and that right. you know Saint Augustine uh, actually imposed the uh, the at Saint Augustine of Canterbury kind of kind of brought in the Latin and kind of imposed the Latin form and right. kind of marginalized the Celtic practices and that they're trying to kind of revive these these Celtic uh, practices at least that's my not everybody it's hard because it's such a it's a mess of people like it's it's all people that are that that are kind of doing different things but that's the sense and I it's like I don't I'm not against it I just I, I'm worrisome about things that are kind of archaeological in their approach where, you know, the traditions that are the traditions that are gone, it's hard to revive them from the outside. Like you find these texts, you find these old texts that aren't even fully there, that are missing pages and they're missing things. And you try to reconstruct the liturgy of of uh, like some fifth century mm -hmm. Celtic saint. It's like, uh, I don't know, man, it's 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 maybe maybe I'm not in I'm not there, but I. I think it's better, like you said, to have something which is handed down and which is which has continuity. And what was tough with me, and maybe tough of you, is I didn't have anything handed down to me. Like even as a, yeah. even as a as a Western Catholic, it was just sort of the 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 nonsense of this you know secular music being played in church, and mm. you know I wasn't even taught how to pray the Holy Rosary. We didn't have incense in church. All of that was gotten rid of because the kids want to be entertained. <laughs> The only thing is, father wasn't as funny as Seinfeld, and the band wasn't as good as Metallica, so that's it right. just came across as lame. <laughs> that, but I think that that, but that's it's a good thing right now because I think that that's one of the things that, that's one of the aspects that is bringing people back to traditional, yeah, uh, liturgical practice. It's that at some point you realize that it works for a while to try to carbon copy the world, but mm. you you run out of breath because you can never you compete, compete with the devil. Like you can't compete with you can't compete with the thing you're taking it from. And so it ends up, it ends up always looking like a pale, like a pale imitation. Totally. And if liturgy is the work of the people, then we go to work. We, we go to, we go out of justice to give God his due to the degree yeah. we can not to sit back and be entertained. Yeah. No, totally, totally, totally. And also because the forms that we have are so awesome. Like the, the, the relationship between the architecture, the liturgy, the images, it's like a, mm. it's 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 this 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 intertextual you know language of references that will blow your mind once you start to look at them more profoundly and you all of a sudden it's like you know I always kind of joke with people that you know people who like Marvel comics or Lord of the Rings <laughs> yeah. and all this stuff where it's like all these characters that interrelate with each yes. other and they have crossovers and everything like that's what liturgy is that's what the whole liturgical yeah. cycle is and the relationship between the architecture and the processions and all of this it's it's basically like a giant marvel comics universe but it's the one you can live in it's not it's not something you look at from the outside you can actually be inside this intertextual uh world of of relate of references and relationship and some parts of this icon appear in this icon and then you know all of a sudden you listen to a a hymn and then it says something and you realize 
why Christ is represented this way on the cross. So there's something in the hymn which is connecting that and then to the story of Jonah and then to Adam even the it's like it's it's just this amazing mm-hmm. ride you can get on when you start to see all these references and how they connect to each other. Oh man, that's really beautiful. Hey, what's your opinion on theistic apologetics? Because from from the short discussion we've had here, it sounds like I, I don't know. It doesn't sound like it plays a primary role in your Christian life. Maybe I'm wrong. No, not at all. Okay, so why is We're, that, and and what's your opinion of it why? generally? <laughs> I, I don't have a I don't have a problem with apologetics. I think I well, I grew up I grew up Baptist, and I grew up having at some point you know having to go knock on doors and tell people that Jesus loved them. And I always I always promised myself that I would never evangelize. When I became Orthodox, oh, I would really? just never evangelize. Is I that why really... Orthodox don't evangelize? There Maybe, is that, there is they're that all kinda... Baptists who, who had to go <laughs> knock on doors. Uh, but then when I started encountering atheists, and atheists started writing me and asking questions and everything, all of a sudden I realized that there may be another way to evangelize, mm-hmm. and it's mostly just talk about how beautiful this is. And not try to explain it in a way of defending the positions and everything, but mostly try to. So the way that I talk about Christianity is always trying to show you how powerful this pattern is and how you can live inside it and how, you know, you won't find a better story than the story of Jesus. There is no better story. Like the story of Jesus has encompasses all strains of storytelling in in its story and i can show it to you i can slowly point at different aspects of jesus's story and show you how it how it brings in all these different elements that you like to watch in movies but they're all there they're all brought together in the story of christ in a way that will blow your mind once you start to see it right so that's mostly been my approach is just to try to surprise people with meaning surprise them with beauty rather than try to defend this or that moral position or this or that, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, and I think you're, even though I think there is absolutely a role for theistic apologetics, because, you know, for, for a lot of people, they're like... I, it I, works for some people. Well, there, are a lot of, there are. I mean, there are people who are like, I actually want to believe. I'm not being mm. stubborn. I'm not trying not to believe. Just show me how this is logical. Um, but I think you're right. I, and for many people, they've been down that road so many times and can't kind of make themselves believe which is interesting because you know Blaise Pascal has that answer to those who want to believe but don't know how. It's like, well, just act like a Christian. Like, take holy water and say your prayers and, and just do the things Christians do and see the coherence You know, your life will, will, will adopt, maybe. Maybe that's mm. uh, more in line with what you're saying. Well, there's something about, like, there's something about the experience of the liturgy, for example, you know, if you do, if you go in with like this openness and you, this desire to encounter it and or the encounter with an icon or the encounter with a very beautiful traditional church that that it goes beyond the argumentation, you know, and yeah. I, there's something about orthodoxy, which is just always traditionally been that, you know, when they when St. Vladimir uh, of Kiev converted to orthodoxy, they always say that it's because, you know, they invited his mother to, to Hagia Sophia. And they said, here, come see what we're doing. And they brought her into the church and she went through uh, this magnificent liturgy with huge choir and, you know, the sound reflecting in all these golden domes. And then she went back home and she said, I was in heaven. Like I just came back from heaven. So, and so I think there's something that is something in the Orthodox tradition, which kind of is Hmm. conducive to that as well. It is. It's more, it's more incarnate, right? Because if we stick to the kind of head arguments, what you're saying to your friend when you invite him to liturgy is like bring your entire being with you, not just your intellect. Like in in experience it and and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. And like one of the things I'm doing, for example, is helping people see the story of Christ appear all over, and also the inevitability. Because one of the things that people don't realize is just how Christian they are without knowing it. You know, and there are certain tropes, for example, in storytelling that are extremely popular right now or just inevitable right now that didn't exist before Christ. It just didn't. You know, the, the the image of the knight, for example, the image of the strong person who is willing to fight to defend the weak and to sacrifice himself for those who can't fight for themselves. That is a Christian story. Huh. It's not a, there was no, none of that in the pagan world. The <laughs> pagan heroes are all jerks. They're yeah. all selfish, like boorish uh, people who only care about their honor. Whereas the knight has that idea that you can fight yeah. uh, for the weak, and so I was just reading Robin Hood lately. It's my like bed bedside story, and it's it's exactly that. And so you and so you can't avoid it. Like the image or the image of the hero who gets knocked down and 
you know, kind of stays down for a while and you feel he's going to lose and he's going to be beaten and then he gets back up at the end. Rocky. And it's such a cliche, but <laughs> without the resurrection, yeah. that story is not, it just wouldn't be part of our of our uh, tropes. And so I try to point to people to say how much the story of Christ has mm. imbued all our forms and that as we actually, as we move away from Christianity, it even becomes more apparent because we start to notice now all of a sudden that every Marvel comic store every marvel movie is about jesus basically yeah. and it's just in the just little parts of of jesus's story that are that are appearing in those well i mean stories. i watched i watched the first thor um which i know is kind of based on mythology anyway but a lot of them are in some way and it's just so christian i mean he yeah he comes to earth <laughs> he dies and saves us and resurrects and then ascends and he, exactly. and he tells his bride he will be back for her. Not his bride, but his girlfriend, you know? Yeah, exactly. He's pretty, coming back for her. Very no, on the nose. I, I think the first Thor movie was Kenneth Branagh, so he probably was doing it very, very much on purpose. But even like the whole arc, like if you look at the the Avengers Endgame and all that stuff, the, at the end, like this, I'm going to spoil the movie. I mean, everybody's seen it by now. so yeah. it, It's I'm your not fault if you it. haven't. Continue. Yeah, exactly. It's your <laughs> fault. So I, I, I keep telling people like when... So when uh, at the end, uh, Iron Man takes the gauntlet, right, and then kills Thanos using the gauntlet, he's making a Lord of the Rings move. Mm -hmm. He's taking the ring and he's using it to fight evil. And so the question is, what's the difference? Like, what's the difference between why in the Lord of the Rings they can't do that? Like, if they take the ring, they're going to be corrupted by its power. Why is it that uh, that Iron Man can take take the ring, Tony Stark can take take the ring and use it to defeat evil without being corrupted. And the reason is that because he sacrificed himself. It's because he died doing it. And that's mm. the only reason why he could do it is because he knew that he was going to die when he did that. And it's a Christian story. It, it just ends up being a Christian story where he takes the power of death, uses it against death to save the mm. world from death, but he has to die himself in order for it to be legitimate. In order for it not to be a form of satanic pride, mm. he has to die. And it's like, what are you going to do? You can't avoid the story. It's just going to, mm. it keeps mm. coming back and back and back. Yeah, trampled death by death. That's beautiful. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, well, hey, um, I've loved our chat. And thank you so kindly for, for, for coming on the show. And I hope we get to chat again. Um, may, maybe for those who are watching on my channel, where can they learn more about you and the great stuff you're involved in? So, I mean, you can find my carvings on my carving website, Pejual Carvings. I'm also on YouTube on The Symbolic World, where I talk about uh, symbolism in all its forms. I have a website called thesymbolicworld.com as well, where we have a blog and different people talking about uh, symbolism as it helps you understand the world we live in. And so those are mostly the place where and you can find And then you also have a great Teespring account that I'm showing people right now. Did you come up with these designs? Did, are these your carvings? <laughs> yes. or? Well, not all. There's a few that there's one, at least one or two that I asked someone I cared about. This I really Cosmic liked Mountain one, I'm going to buy like a hundred of them as soon as, as soon as we're done. That's a, that's like the work of, that's like the work of 20 years, I would say. So I've been thinking about this Cosmic <sighs> The idea of representing everything in one image for a very long time. Hmm. And so finally last year, I had the guts to kind of put it together. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's on, Tell us about it because it's on the well, screen I mean, for people to see right now. It's based on the, let's say, a kind of bringing together of the, the story of Genesis with the crucifixion of Christ. But also it joins all different elements of iconography together in one image. I have a video on my ah. YouTube channel if people want to okay. find out about what what elements that I drag into this 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 picture, but it's also a description of, uh, let's say the the hymns on paradise by Saint Ephraim the Syrian, yes. and uh, you know the, the the ascent of the Moses of Moses on the mountain mm -hmm. in Saint Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Moses. <clears throat> so all of the things that I love about Christianity, basically, brought into one image, this like cosmic image. So it's really terrific. And so how did you do that? I mean, did you do that on the computer? Was it a carving that you? Oh, it's a drawing. It's a it's a hand it's a hand drawing. Yeah. Oh my goodness, dude! You're a very talented man, and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Good stuff. Thanks. Thank you very much for watching. Before you go, I want to invite you to consider supporting us on patreon.com slash Matt Frad. When you do, you get a bunch of free things in return, like 
you know, books sent to your door, stickers sent to your door, free beer steins. You get access to these online courses that we've done on St. Augustine's Confessions or Dante's Divine Comedy or the Bible or the great books of Western civilization. Um, you just get to join an awesome community of Catholics and non-Catholics. We have Catholics and non-Catholics over on my Patreon account who love to engage in thoughtful and interesting discussions. So please consider it patreon.com slash Matt Frad, patreon.com slash Matt Frad. And when you do, as I say, you'll get a bunch of free things in return. I really appreciate it. Thank you.